And why I say that is uh, Patrick O'Kelly's Nothing But Blood and Slaughter is one of those other four major units you always have to look at no matter what you're studying. And, and later this afternoon, we've got a third gospel writer here today. So keep in mind this powerful work and many works that Patrick O'Kelly does. I haven't been here in about a decade, and the main reason I haven't been here is because every time this happens, it's always in October, or I think at one time it was in February, but what it was is that's a, a major month for reenacting. And I'm usually, I'm either the, the guy who writes the scenario, which means I'm literally the director of a, a reenactment, or I'm the guy commanding troops. And so I've never been here because of that. For some weird oddball reason, this month, there's no reenactment. I have no idea what happened there. But because of that, I finally came back after back about a decade of time. I got my notes here. I, I literally wrote this notes up last night. Uh, I did not know there was a PowerPoint, so it just beat my voice and a lot of animation. My notes say, do not read all the paper, you will be boring. Try not to use the F word. All right. <laughs> uh, ever since I retired, I've reverted back to the language of my people, so I will try to do that. All right. What this is about, well, actually, uh, I think it was Christine Swagger asked me, well, it may not be Christine, but somebody asked me on the email, will you come here and do this? And I said, sure, because my book just came out again. And I said, will you do a talk? Like, okay, you guys have been doing this for over a decade. Isn't everything been talked about? What the heck could I talk about that hasn't been beat to death? So I couldn't think of what would be original. And so what I decided, I'm just going to tell you how the orderly book came about because that's what my book is, is the orderly book. Now, nickname for that thing is the phone book, and you can see why. It is huge. But what this is, is this year, the orderly book has been reappeared. How was that? And this is the story about the orderly book. How you basically create an orderly book. Well, what do you do to fill the holes when you don't have any information? Now, I am going to be reading some stuff because otherwise I'm going to get the information wrong and then people will quote me and the next thing you know I'm like. Now, what is an orderly book? This is, the nickname is Francis Marion's orderly book. Francis Marion did not write this. You guys are guy's a commander of a whole unit. He's going to sit down and write little orders. No, you get privates to do that. So orderly book is mainly written by privates, corporals, NCOs. They write down the orders of the day. How it works is every single company. Now I've got to figure out how many companies are in a regiment. Now, you're looking at least a bare minimum of 10. So you got every single company within a regiment had an orderly book. Now, the regiment adjutant had his own orderly book. He's the guy who originates it. But each regiment at any time is keeping 10 orderly books. Now, the orderly book, if you expand it, you go to the whole army. How many orderly books are in the whole army? You've got orderly books for brigade, division, wings, department, headquarters. You're talking like 100 different people writing down orders every day of what is going on in that army. So you have all these orderly books. Now, the process for these is how it worked in the morning. Brigade adjutant would gather in uh, the uh, but all the brigade adjutants, not just uh, one, but all of them would gather at the adjutant general's office in the morning. Now, brigade adjutants would then transcribe the orders of the day into the book. What are we doing today? What are we doing tomorrow? If there's a battle coming up, what are the orders for the battle? Things like that. Now, those brigade adjutants would then receive any division orders, and then they return to their brigades. They would then call their people together, and they would tell their regimental adjutants the orders of the day. And the regimental adjutants would bring in the company, and the companies would call in the orders of the day. So you got to realize how many of these orderly books are out there. Huge numbers. But unfortunately today, there's only a handful left compared to what originated. Now, for any particular date, the content of all the books would be essentially identical, except for some additional things unique to the division or the company, you know, depending on the company or brigade or something like that. There are slight differences. So there is what appeared in the Francis Marion Orderly Book, 
is for the second South Carolina, would also appear in the first South Carolina and the third South Carolina. It'd be almost the same orders unless it got down to specifically what's going on in that second South Carolina. For example, if they were actually manning Fort Moultrie, when they, everybody did a, a, a time in Fort Moultrie and then they pulled out. In other words, they went in, went out, went in. It was a rotating duty. So words, your orders for when you're in Fort Moultrie would be different than your orders when you're in the barracks of Charleston. So that's the only slight differences. Now, spelling varied considerably. Uh, today, we, we have the grammar Nazis. Everything's got to be perfect. Back then, they would have laughed at you. In fact, there's a famous quote out there that anybody who spells the same way twice is not very imaginative or original. And so you just change your spelling all the time. By the way, if you ever do get into history, don't get wrapped around somebody's name being misspelled. Like, oh, it's, it's supposed to be this way. It's supposed to be They changed the name of their, their, their own names depending on what mood they were in. So sometimes you might see a French spelling. Sometimes you might see a German spelling. It just depended on where they wanted to do a time. A great example of this is General Von Steuben. You hardly ever heard him called Von Steuben when he was with Washington's Army. He was called D. Steuben. He changed his name because depending on what mood he's in. Now, uh, in 1780, Major General Robert Howe, the guy in charge of the whole uh, army at that time, made an inspection of uh, all the orderly books being maintained at West Point in the Highlands Department. Now, that has nothing to do with Francis Marion. I'm just telling you an example here. Now, he described what he had seen as being incomprehensible, incoherent parcel of stuff. And most of the orderly books were transcribed by sergeants who did not do a very good job. And they were, some orders weren't even authorized by the officers. The sergeants made them up because they felt like it. <laughs> now, Many officers did write their own official correspondence, and they had men, usually sergeants from within the company, acting as aides or secretaries, writing these letters. The officers simply signed them. For example, Francis Marion didn't write the Marion Orderly Book, but he did sign the orders off because he's the guy in charge. Now, the idea of officers, especially of high rank, like Green or Lincoln, uh, the idea of them writing their own Orderly Books is a myth. Uh, that came mainly Unfortunately, the historical societies, about you know, 100 years ago, they kind of made up a lot of things. Uh, they started donating these sets of books and swearing that it was actually written by Francis Marion. It was actually written by Nathaniel Green. No, they were not. They were written by some lowly private who spelled that. <laughs> now, major example of this is the collection of the Library of Congress, which is cataloged on the basis of the surname of the supposed officer author. So whenever you try to find something about a unit, it always says that, like, Mary wrote this. Remember, he did not write this. Now, there are long runs of orderly books uh, from Revolutionary War that still exist. Uh, the best runs are those kept at the Library of Congress. Uh, the best one outside of this one was William Torrey, an adjutant of the 2nd Massachusetts Regiment. He had 23 volumes and went from September 1777 to May 1783, and there was big gaps in between. There's also good runs for other units, like the 8th Massachusetts, 6th Massachusetts, you know, the Yankee units. Um, however, none of them can beat this. This is the one that tops them all. This has daily entries going from the beginning of the war, 1775, all the way to the end of the war, 1782. That's why it looks like a phone book. Now, that's seven years worth of orderly book. Nobody has anything that long running. Now, what makes this one fascinating is the fact that Marion, or I should say Marion, his sergeant, but they kept the orders when he was a conventional unit commander. And Marion was an excellent conventional unit commander. And usually when everybody talks about Francis Marion, they talk about the guerrilla aspect, the unconventional. But again, remember, he, he broke his, you know, you know his, his teeth on, broke his teeth, that's a weird expression. Anyway, he, he basically learned how to be the commander he was in conventional unit first. You know, he's the guy that was in charge of 2nd South Carolina in Savannah. He wasn't in charge of 2nd South Carolina at Fort Sullivan, but he was there in charge of uh, you know, a lesser unit. So he was an excellent conventional commander. But the neat thing about this orderly book is he also kept up an orderly book when he became a guerrilla. That's unusual. Because usually when you're running, <laughs> if you, uh, some of you know my past, I'm a guy that actually did work behind lines, and I was kind of a guerrilla guy. And 
you, when you're doing that, you don't have a lot of time to take notes and write things down. You know, you're kind of busy. But Marion did it anyway. So the orderly book covers his time as an unconventional warrior too, all the way up until the time that his partisans, his guerrillas, became conventional again and fought like the Battle of Utah Springs. Now, what this order book shows us is Marion is a commander who believed in discipline and order. He was extreme about that. Even when he was living in patrol base in the swamps in the Waysburg district, he still had discipline and order. Now, Parson is extremely voluntary. Um, Marion did not get as many men as other Parsons. For example, if you look at some of the biggest Parson fights that Marion is in, he might have 10 guys, maybe at the most 100. Compare that to Sumter, who had like over 1,000. And the difference is standards. I like to compare it to differences today. And by the way, if you're a Marine out there, don't get angry at me. <laughs> I like to compare it to the United States Marine Corps versus Delta Force. There is a difference in standards. There is a difference in selection. There is a difference in training. The difference is the Marine Corps, you've got thousands. But Delta Force, you have 12 or 20. So the difference is the standards. Mary had basically higher standards, and because of that, not a lot of the men wanted to go fight with him. They wanted to go with Sumter, because Sumter lets you do what the heck you wanted to. You go rampage, pillage, and steal stuff. It's great. Marion, like, no, you ain't going to steal anything. Stop that. And so the men that went with Marion were a higher caliber, kind of like the Delta Force. All right. Now, after the war, the records of all the South Carolina regiments were stored in the state archives. Now, this orderly book ended up in Huntington Library in California. I actually wrote to Huntington trying to find out well, how did it get there, and they never did. They never talked to me back. So, as a typical Southerner, I suspect it's evil Yankees. <laughs> now, first time I heard about the orderly book was I was writing. No, I got my books here. The four-volume series, uh, nothing but blood and slaughter. <laughs> now, there's a whole story behind this. I did all these reenactments in North Carolina, South Carolina, and every time you go into a history book, you, you, you found nothing. It's like, how come this isn't there? How come this isn't there? And finally, it's like, you know what? Nobody else is going to write the book. I will. And I figured I could knock it out in about six months. Five years later, I finally came out with the book. And the nothing but blood and slaughter is every single battle that happened in the two Carolinas. And I'm telling you right now, this book is old. I mean, this thing was published like, I think I'm going on 20 years now. Uh, but Bates a while ago. And eventually, if I stop being so retired, right now I'm so retired, I'm so busy, I don't know what to do with myself. Uh, but if I quit being real retired and do some other type of retired, I might actually come out with the second version of this. But as I'm writing this, I was trying to get information about any way I could. I wanted mainly primary documentation. I didn't want to rehash what other historians said. I wanted the words out of the mouth of the men that were there. Now, my unit is the 2nd North Carolina Regiment. My reenactment unit is the 2nd North Carolina Regiment. Um, we work closely with the 2nd South Carolina Regiment. In fact, to this day, there's a lot of people that get confused of what unit is which, and they just call me 2nd South, call them 2nd North, it's all mixed up. Now, we work together so close that uh, as I was writing the information about this, all of a sudden I heard about the Francis Mary Norton book. It's like, oh, you got something. You've got primary documentation. Can I see that? And unfortunately, no, I could not because I was not in the second South Carolina. <laughs> now, solution to that, I joined the second South Carolina <laughs> just to get my hands on the early one. Now, it turns out, and here's kind of the history of how the orderly book came to be. The original guy who acquired microfiche copies of the orderly book from Huntington Library was a guy called Paul Burke of the 2nd South Carolina. He's one of the plank holders of the 2nd South Carolina. Now, it was old microfish fail, the old real real. Now, I'm looking out across this crop of cotton, and everybody here knows what microfish is. Meanwhile, my daughter back there probably doesn't know what microfish is. <laughs> but uh, you guys understand what I'm talking about on microfish, and you're sitting there reeling it, looking at one page at a time. Now, to see the early book, you had to have a microfish reader. So that was the one drawback. Paul Burke had his own microfish reader. And when Paul Burke left the 2nd South Carolina, he gave the files to a guy called Doug Crutchfield. 
Now, Doug Crutchfield had the files, and somewhere along the line, another member of the Second South Carolina called Doyle Harper got a hold of it. Now, what Doyle Harper did was he took some of the pages and got them Xeroxed on the paper. And there's another thing. He said, the fact that I say Xerox kind of dates me, because again, my daughter back there, if I say Xerox, she doesn't know what that means. <laughs> Now, I'm throwing my daughter under the bus and she's back there blood blushing and shining away. Now, Doyle Harper hang, held on to the orderly book for about 20 years and transcribed pages. And so when I popped up and said, hey, can I see it? What I got was some transcription from Doyle Harper. Now, I was writing this book. I wasn't writing the orderly book. I never even planned on writing the orderly book. I was going to write my own book. Uh, now, to get it, I had to join the Second Sacred Line. Now, this wasn't any subversive thing. When I joined them, I told them, I'm joining you so I can get a copy of the Orly book. I, I'm sure. <laughs> but because we were such friends, and they, they knew me, I knew them, we always worked together, I, okay, not a problem. So I got voted in, and I got a copy, a digital copy of the Orly book. Now, when I started going through the digital copy, I noticed there was mistakes in what Doyle Harper had done. And the mistakes was mainly because you got to see the orderly book. In fact, I have. I mean, I made copies, Xerox, and I've got an example on the table back there, and I'll have this too. This is the original book right here. And if you look at this, trying to transcribe it, holy cow, it is mind-numbing. Mainly because, remember I told you, all those privates from the 18th century didn't know how to spell right? They had bad handwriting too. So... Uh, Doyle Harper made mistakes, but it wasn't intentional. It was just you could not understand what was on these pages. So I got my fingers on it, and I used what just small amounts, mainly things about battles and stuff for this book. Now, what happened next was, um, uh, of first off, I was kind of sworn to secrecy too. Well, I shouldn't say secrecy. I was sworn that I would never ever give out those copies unless somebody was a member of the second South Carolina because it's like an in-house thing you kept it in-house it's like okay I could do this now um, like I said I never intended to write the Francis Marion order book but then all of a sudden I have people coming up to me asking me because in here they see reference to the Francis Marion order book and they ask me where did I see it and it's like well I have copies and people are asking me well can we get a copy of it Remember, I'm sworn never to give out those copies to anybody unless they're in the second South Carolina. And if I did, I guess secret assassins with ninjas would come after me or something. I don't know. But uh, uh, so basically I told them, no, you can't. But then it dawned on me, this has got to be published somewhere. It's got to. This thing's been around for you know, Revolutionary War. Somebody had to publish this. But the only thing I found was small, teeny weeny excerpts in the uh, South Carolina Historical Geological Society or something like that. Just little excerpts. Nobody had ever published it. And I know now I know why. I mean, now that I've published uh, I know, eight books, I know the reason why. Look at it. This is a bookseller's nightmare. Uh, they don't want this. They don't want a phone book. They want something small that will fit on the shelf. And so this is the nightmare. No publisher would touch it. The publishers all said, no, it's too regional, it's too local, nobody will buy that thing. And they're actually telling the truth. I, I don't sell that many copies of this because it is regional, it is local. Uh, it's mainly people who are interested in Francis Marion. And the fact that it's an orderly book means it's not real exciting, it's just a bunch of orders. Now, um, going through my pages here, make sure I get all the notes. Now, as I started transcribing, I decided I would do I would make the orderly book. I would transcribe it and turn it into an actual book. And part of the way of turning an actual book is not just making the orderly book, but also in between the orders, explain what is going on. Because you may not understand the, the historical timeline, the context. Like, why are they doing this? Oh, that's because this is happening in Charleston Harbor. Why are they doing this? Oh, it's because this battle is about to happen. So the orderly book I interspersed with a bunch of basically historical excerpts from this book uh, and some uh, additions, but mainly telling you what is going on with all the orders. So that way it made it at least a little more interesting. Because like I said, an orderly book by itself is dry, but now it becomes a history book. Now, um, 
how did I transcribe the parts that were almost unreadable? First thing I did was I made negatives. In other words, I took the, the white piece of paper and then on my computer, I made it a negative where now it's black paper and white words. And sometimes you can actually see the words. And so I did that trying to see what the word is. Next thing I did was I compared, remember, orderly books are not just one place, they're everywhere. So there are a handful of orderly books out there. You got uh, the orderly book of Peter Ori, you got Benjamin Marion's first South Carolina orderly book, the diary of Captain Bernard Elliott. And so I took their books and I compared them, and with the two comparisons, I'm able to actually see that they're what the words are supposed to mean. Then the internet kind of came along. And we're talking like, this is after about, oh, about 2000. So all of a sudden the internet's kicking into overdrive. You really didn't have Facebook yet. You didn't have social media as we know it today. But you had the old, basically I call them message boards. But you had one that was called the Revelist. And the Revelist was well over like 2,000 people who, from all across the nation who were interested in the Revolutionary War. So what I would do is if I could not understand something, what's going on, I just put the excerpt on the Revelist and go, what is this? And somebody would know. And somebody would know what it means. Like one was a quote from a, 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 the Three Penny Opera. And there was, nobody would understand that because at that time, that was popular. Everybody knew what it was. It would be like today, somebody quoting something from a popular TV show and then somebody 200 years from now reading it. And they don't know what that popular TV show is. Why'd you say that? What does that mean? It's, but I understood what was going on because they were using slang from the 18th century in some of the orders, and it started making sense. Now, Doyle Harper started this. So what I did was I went to Doyle Harper and I told him, hey, we really need to publish this thing. And i tell you what, me and you, let's do a, a, a basically a combined effort. When we both take credit, it gets out there. And Doyle Harper kind of sat on it for a while. He didn't want to do anything. Well. My big worry was somebody else would come along and do this orderly book, and they wouldn't give it the, the dedication, the interest of somebody who's actually from the Carolinas. You know, somebody from Ohio doing an orderly book. Oh, it's Francis Mary. <laughs> All right, so I went over there. <laughs> Next thing you know, you got people running around, you know, front, swamp, box, gum, something like that. Stop it. All right. So, Doe Harper didn't do anything. So, what I did was I went up and I, gave, I kind of gave him the ultimatum. I said, dude, I'm going to give you one year. Do something with this order book. You've got one year. If you don't do anything after one year, I'm going to hop on it. And the year came and went. And I asked him, I said, have you asked the Huntington Library, can you even publish this? And he said, I haven't talked to Huntington Library. So first thing I did was I went to Huntington Library. I said, can I publish this thing? And they went, oh, cool. Somebody actually wants to do that? Okay. Because nobody's touched it because it's so huge. Now, once I actually got permission from Huntington Library, I went into the early book with a vengeance and went through all my notes and everything, retranscribing it. That entire process took about five years. I'm not a fast book writer. And one other thing I did to make it interesting to another group of people was every single name that is mentioned in Francis Mary's early book I cut down the name. Who is this guy? And so what I did in footnotes, I wrote down, this is this guy. He lived here. He was born here. He did this. He died here. If he was really important, he did this, this, this. So all of a sudden, the Francis Mary Mar Orley book went from being an Orley book and then to a history book, but now to a genealogy book. And so people that have connections to somebody who might have actually served with Mary, which of course we know is every single person in, in South Carolina. Uh, but now if you actually have the name and you find it in the book, you can find out more information about it. So I tracked down every single name I could. If for some reason I found a name that I didn't know about, I just wrote, I couldn't find anything. That's rare. I swear, I think uh, maybe, maybe six or seven times I couldn't track down a name. Now, one of the people that I used heavily it's Bobby Moss, all of his books on the, the Patriots and the Revolution. So he gets the credit for actually tracking down all the names. I just looked them up. All right. Now, <coughs> the first time the Orderly Book came out, it was called Unwearied Patience and Fortitude. And it got a buddy of mine and his dad's on the cover. Now, why? I tried to do everything on the cheap because it's going to be expensive anyway. I didn't want to throw more money out there. 
And another thing I did on the cheap, there's some illustrations in there. Uh, I did the maps, I did some illustrations, but also remember that Revelist thing? I, I said, hey, any of you guys artists out there, if you, uh, if you do some drawings for me, I'll give you a free book. And I'll give you credit. And so there's a handful of drawings in here, just people that did it because they had nothing better to do, I guess. Now, Unwearing Patience and Fortitude, where'd that come from? One of the last entries in the orderly book is when Marion is saying, I'm done. Kind of like Washington's farewell address. It's Marion's farewell address. And the British have left Charleston. It's 1782, and he's telling his men, you know, time to go home. And what he says, I am going to read this. The general returns his warmest thanks to the officers and men who with unwearied patience and fortitude have undergone the greatest fatigues and hardships and with spirit and bravery, which must ever reflect the highest honor of them. No citizens of the world have ever done more than they have. And so I was trying to find an uplifting quote to give the title of the book, and I gave it, Unwearied Patience and Fortitude. Now, my first publisher was Infinity Publishing. Now, Infinity Publishing was one of the few that would say, okay, we'll do that. Um, and it, 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 it sold a few. But then Infinity Publishing was bought by a company called Fast Pencil. And Fast Pencil took the book, and I also have another book, and this one's about what I did before. It's called Triple Canopy. So that was also Infinity Publishing. Now, they took it. I think it was sugar it. They stole my money. What they did was they would publish the book and sell it and not give me anything and tell me they weren't selling it. Now, wait, wait. This is the world of um, digital age, and it's all over Amazon. Where you find my books is on any online seller, Amazon bookseller, whatever. Evidently, the guy who ran Fast Pencil didn't realize that if you sell books on Amazon, you can look on there and sell it to see exactly how many books you have and how many are selling. And so I wrote back to the guy, dude, you owe me this much money. You're ripping me off. He's like, oh, it must be a technicality. But they still held up. It took a while, but I finally got the North Carolina uh, uh, Attorney General involved. And so Fast Pencil, I told him, quit publishing the book. Give me my money. And they did. Now, the bad thing was the book's no longer being published. And it wasn't being published for like five years. Um, seems like everything's in five year stint. Mm -hmm. right. Now, what I do on the side in my, my retirement, like I said, I'm a very busy retirement, is I, I help train special forces. Um, I, it's, a, it's a mission out there called Robin Sage. Now, the guys who run Robin Sage are former special forces guys. Well, I'm on Robin Sage, and I'm, I'm the bad guy. So it's, if, you, if you screw up on the objective, I show up and, and make your life hell. So basically, I'm sitting around in between missions. You know, I'm doing research. I'm always doing research. And the guy who runs the lane is an old Delta Force guy. And he sees what I'm doing. And he goes, hey, what's that? And so I explained what it was. What I didn't know is he ran a publishing company. <laughs> now, he publishes specific things, mainly things that are unconditional warfare, guerrilla warfare. He writes books about you know all the World War II and, and even before that. And he puts them out and he sells them uh, mainly to uh, the officers and stuff going through the special forces course so they can learn from the, uh, um, the, the guerrillas from the past. Well, he goes, I'll do that. I'll publish it. It's like, okay. Now I said, I'll publish your other book too. It's like, okay. <laughs> I'm not going to argue with him. So due to him, eh, we now have the Francis Mary Norley book again as of this year. Now, what's really neat, and unfortunately, I can kick myself now. But the first thing he sold was a hardcover. I went, holy crap, it's hardcover. He goes, yeah. And he goes, it's like a $69 price. I went, Dude, nobody's going to buy a $69 book. What are you insane? And he goes, so you got to get it. You got to get back to paperback. You can't be hardcover. And he goes, okay. So I have both hardcover and paperback. They're both huge. Now, the reason I said I could kick myself is I said, oh, that mean, not many people are going to do hardcover. So. I'll just bring five. I've already sold all five out, guys. I'm sorry. So all I got left is a soft cover. Now, there has been a few changes. If you, if you bought the first Francis Mary Northern book, oh, well, the one change is, is the title. The, the title, Unwearied Patience and Fortitude, is almost boring. I mean, you got some people who don't know what unwearied means. You have to look it up in the dictionary. So I decided I want a, a snazzier title. So what I do, I threw it out to my buddies on the internet going, dude, give me a snazzier title. And if you do, I'll give you credit in the book for coming up with the title. And sure enough, 
The title is Be Cool and Do Mischief. <laughs> now, where'd that title come from? That's what Moultrie was told at Sullivan. You know, here's your 500 pounds of powder. Be cool and do mischief. And I said, oh, that's an awesome title. We're going to go roll that. Now, the other thing is, uh, I ejected my buddy off the cover. Uh, him and his dad, you're gone. And there's a guy who actually paints real paintings, a guy named Brian White. And I said, he's a buddy of mine. And I said, hey, can I use your painting? He goes, okay. So I, I got a new cover, and that's Francis Baring sitting in a swamp on his horse. So that's the, kind of the external changes. But inside, also there are changes. Because you got to realize, I told you, it took me about five years in between the first one and the second one. History is ever-changing. And I don't mean revisionist history. I mean new things being found. And so it's always changing, constantly. My first books, these things are so outdated, it's not funny. That's why eventually i got to really come out with a new one. But this one, change, what I did was I, I put the changes in here. And i tell you one of the more interesting things I found that's in there. There's a picture of Francis Mary. I drew it with a mustache. <laughs> and why is that? Because when he was coming back from Savannah, the guy who was the overall commander looks and says, all right, all right, hold on. All your guys are running around with mustaches. What's up with that crap? And he goes, <laughs> shave it. All right, so they had to shave it before they showed up in Charleston. The reason they were doing that is in Savannah, they were with the French, and there's a French unit that has mustaches. Nobody had beards. Nobody had mustaches in the 18th century. It's unheard of. It's so rare. It's, it's, if somebody actually had one, they wrote about it. But the fact that all these guys are sporting mustaches is because you got to realize the American Army is kind of like a, a good comparison. Is think of the Afghan Army when we were there, uh, you know, ten years ago. Uh, they copied the Americans because the Americans are professionals. And we want our gear to look like the Americans. We want to act like the Americans because these guys really know what they're doing. Well, Marion's men were the same way. They weren't professionals. They've only been fighting this war thing for a few years. So all of a sudden, the French come along. The French were considered one of the greatest armies in the world, and these guys had mustaches. And so it's like. We're going to grow a mustache and look like a professional army. But it is, it's higher up back in the rear, like, no, 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 shave that crap off before you get in the city. So, yeah, there's a, the whole, the actual letter about shaving your mustache is in the new one. And I, did, I drew a picture of Marion with a mustache. Now, uh, don't want to gobble up too much time, but here's some interesting things that's in the Orly book. Things that are in the Orly book that are real interesting. First off, you're not supposed to duel, but there's entire passages where these two officers are really angry at each other, and the next thing you know, one's dead. But if you, it's almost like reading between the lines. You see, oh man, these guys ended up, eventually, somebody killed the other guy. So those are in there. Uh, there's, what's really needed here is, uh, I want to say one of the shoe bricks, I can't, I can't remember which one off the top of my head, but when he died, it wasn't in a war, it wasn't in a battle. It was like, you know, while they were in uh, Charleston in between the wars, or in, the, in between the battles. But the entire ceremony, they wrote down word for word what every man has to do. That's excellent for reenactors because if you ever want to duplicate, uh, you know, how to do a memorial ceremony, they're telling you right there exactly how to do it. Uh, you have corruption. Oh, man, graft. My favorite one is the Sergeant Major of the 2nd South Carolina who gets in the early book and he's like, oh, they're the... Uh, the, uh, the, the sutler is corrupt. He's screwing over all the men, charging too much. I'm firing him. The next day, I am resigning and I'm retiring from the army. The next day after that, I'm now the sutler of the second sutler. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, you also had a constant animal house attitude. That's about the best way to put it. Is there, there's constant orders, quit running around naked. Uh, quit shooting at things off the barracks windows. Don't shoot at birds. What is like, all right, all you guys in Fort Sullivan, quit cracking off the edge of the fort because it's nasty. Uh, oh, hair. Uh, it tells you exactly what type of hair he wants. And I'm not kidding. When you read the description, it's a mullet. It's a short hair, long hair. Now, if you don't know it, nobody wore a wig back then. Now, wigs were considered old-fashioned and stuff. Nobody had a wig. But the fact that they wig, the men had short hair and long hair, I thought that was one of the first bullets. Excellent. Now, they had a, a government-funded education system in the second South Carolina. Now, one of the soldiers was a teacher. And you have, in any army, you have women and kids. And so this distaff, this these camp followers, what do you, they set up a, a school for the kids. And this one guy got detached. Your job now is to teach kids. And that's in the early book. Um, 
You got women, good and bad. And I'm telling you, if, you, if I, all of a sudden you had a time machine, you went back to the 18th century, that would be a great thing because you know where to go. Uh, uh, so the good women, every, every unit was authorized a uh, certain number of women to do specific things. And the biggest thing women did in the 18th century, more than anything else, wasn't cook food. The men cooked their own food. It was laundry, more than anything else. So they had that, but then there was the bad women. And so they're listed there too. It's like, don't see this woman. Stay away from that place. One of the places they keep saying, do not go anywhere near is the Blue House Tavern. Because it's corrupt, there's graft, it's heinous. And so because of that, I call my farm Blue House Farms and it's Blue House Tavern Press. <laughs> um, now, Savannah was so deadly. I mean, it was, gonna, it was the pickets charge of the South. And if, you don't, if you're not familiar with it, you ought to be. And they knew they were all going to get slaughtered, and mainly because the French screwed everything up. And they did it anyway because that's what you do. And it was like a World War I charge, and they got slaughtered. And they knew it was going to be killing everybody, so they needed more bodies, and they armed the servants. Now, what does that mean? They armed the black guys. In other words, they armed everybody, put a gun in their hands. Black guy, here's a gun. And so get in there and fight. And so it was just a really diverse army going into spring uh, uh, Savannah. Let's see, what else? I already talked about mustaches. Punishments. Oh, man, they got every punishment you can think of. It's awesome. They ate lashes like breakfast, I guess. You know, this guy gets 500 lashes. I know in the movies today, a guy gets 10 lashes, he faints. They would have laughed at him back then. It's like, dude, you got to wait till you get 500 before you faint. Uh, they, they, they also did you know, the, the run in the, the, the gauntlet, where that's the one where you screwed over your guys in your unit, they get revenge on you. Be like having a barracks Steve, or something like that. And so you had to run through the middle of all the guys in the unit. They had the ram run out. They smacked the crap out of you when you went by. And they hit you enough, they probably could kill you. Uh, let's see. Oh, putting on women's clothes. That was one. If you did something really heinous, they made you wear women's clothes and drum you out of the unit. Uh, they had the pit. I mean, like you, know, like you see from Cool Hand Loop, the pit. Or yeah, the cave. You get in the black hole. They had that. Uh, they also, at one point in time, the Second South Carolina became Marines. What I mean by that is the, not the modern day Marine Corps. The 18th century Marines were basically the, uh, the, the small fighting force on a ship that would go up in the tops and shoot down and things like that. Well, they needed a bunch of these guys because it was massive loyalist privateers off the coast. And they, so they armed, South Carolina armed its own navy. In fact, a lot of you, whenever you see that flag right there, that flag is actually the South Carolina Navy flag. The one with the snake on it and uh, the stripes. That's where it came from. And so they went out with this fleet, but they needed more Marines. And so the second South Carolina and the first South Carolina both volunteered for that. So these guys ended up being Marines. Now, uh, that's my, that's eight pages right there. I don't know how much time I've eaten up. But basically, I came up here to tell you how the Orderly Book was created and how it came to be. I guess I go for questions, and if I don't know, I'll just lie and make it up. <laughs> so, yes. so where did the first uh, published version come out? The first published version came out, and I'm probably going to lie about this, but I want to say 2009 or 10, I think. Hmm. And like I said, it got ripped off, and it took five years to come out again. So about, about the, actually, when it, if you want to be official, we can be official. Sorry to waste your time, I'm going to look up when I pull it. There's another question I can run to you real quick. What's that? No more questions? Okay, find out what the date is. 2006. All right, any other questions? Yes? Yes, ma'am. Here, let me bring you the microphone. Um, okay. I can probably do it. Maybe. Maybe not. Uh, I can blow it up to me. I have a school teacher, George. Uh, I'm looking for an ancestor that was, I have, you know, accreditation that he was in Halifax, North Carolina. And uh, also, he has a pay stub with the National Archives that he received funds, uh, and, and he was on a list of Francis Marion. So I want to know if somebody from Halifax, for instance, or North Carolina, could uh, fight with Francis Marion. And uh, I also have a list, uh, his, uh, a name, John Mills, listed on there uh, that of people who fought with Francis Marion. So I'm looking to prove my John Mills fought with Francis 
Marion in the second regiment of North Carolina. Well, if it was in the second North Carolina, well, here's the deal. Second North Carolina is my unit that I recreate, and I also know the history of that. At one time, they were in Fort Sullivan with Francis Marion. They were under him. There was a detachment. Now, it wouldn't have been when he was a girl. It wouldn't have been a parson, because Second North Carolina ceased to exist when Francis Marion became a parson. They were all captured in Charleston, and they didn't come back together again, reform until Utah Springs. So, uh, your other question is, would somebody from North Carolina fight in South Carolina? North Carolina was probably the largest supplier of soldiers for many states because uh, they just didn't have enough. Part of the problem was slavery. Uh, you got to figure whenever you had a population of slave uh, state, uh, South Carolina, a good portion of the population was slaves, and they didn't want them to fight that much. Even though I told you they armed them in the book, it tells it. So they didn't have enough uh, non-slaves to fight, so they brought people in anywhere they could. Georgia, most of the Georgia regiments were North Carolinians and Virginians, and then a good chunk of the South Carolina regiments were North Carolinians and, to a lesser point, Virginians. So is it possible? Oh, yeah, it's entirely possible. And actually, your ancestors, you look, anybody that I listed by name, they're in the index, so you can always look up and see who's in the book. Any other questions? Okay. Yes? Yes, sir. Two, uh, two questions about location of camps. First is Amy's Mill. Yes. Is that today's Fair Bluff or? Uh, Amy's Mill is actually, it was, it was French, A-M-I-S, and uh, Amy's Mill, and you know, Ami, that kind of thing. And the actual location of that is you've got to go up the river into North Carolina and heading toward Lumberton. The actual location of it, I actually tell you in the book exactly where it is because I tracked that one down. And that, again, that really, that was kind of sort of me, but it was also a feller named John Robertson. I don't know if you're familiar with him. He, he had an excellent website where he tracked down where everything was in the Revolutionary War. But it was in North Carolina, uh, probably about, I want to say 20 miles north of the border. The second question is Snow, uh, Snow Island. Have you gained any insight as to where Snow Island actually was? We know where it is, but my, my understanding is very little archaeological uh, data, data has been found at that point. Uh, Snow's Island, I mean, a lot of people, you, 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 like you said, you know where it is generally, and you can walk the ground that he was on, but because of the damming projects, during you know, the 1920s and stuff like that. Creeks rose, creeks fell, and you kind of lost it. But we, we tend to know generally where it is. I mean, I, I can give you, you know, if, it was, if I was dropping a bomb on it, I'd probably miss. But if I if I just wanted to give you a big old grid square, I might be in the right spot. I don't know. And Steve Smith is here. He's been working on the... Yeah. 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 So we shouldn't be very concerned about the fact that a little archaeological... No, it's a swamp. And because of that, it's, most everything might have moved or buried in muck. And so I, I wouldn't get wrapped up. I mean, if you if you really want to know exactly where it is, then you ask yourself, why? And as I can give you within a few, within a mile of where it is, but do you, except for people that just archaeologists want to get there and dig around, other than that, do you really, why? And it's kind of like when I, I used to teach history. I was a school teacher for 20 years, too. Uh, I was in the military 20 years, then school teacher for 20 years, taught history. That's what my daughter's doing back there, she's teaching history. And uh, I always told my students, I don't really care if you know the date of something. I want you to know why, and what was the main reason for it, and what was the result of it. Because that's how you learn history. You can memorize dates all you want to, but does it really help you in the big picture? So there's, it, the only people that really want to know where it is are archaeologists, but other than that, it's historians. Do you really need to know exactly where it is? As long as you're within a mile or so, you're probably good. We have one question over here. Yeah. I want to know if you found out anything about the Indians that you didn't know about his bodyguards, Francis Marion's bodyguards. Did he refer to them very much or anything? I have never heard of anybody ever referred to as bodyguard or French Mary. Now, I mean, you got to realize, later, many people embellished what they did. I'm not, I'm not, if you've got ancestors and they said something, don't get all mad at me because I had ancestors like that too. Like all of a sudden, they're a colonel. And in reality, they were never a colonel, they were a private. Uh, there's actually a reason for that. Turns out as they met, as the years went by, 
Uh, usually the last ones left alive, they just gave him an honorary colonel, and so they started calling themselves colonel. But Francis Marion never saw a bodyguard. First off, he didn't really need it, because a, a unit commander wouldn't need a bodyguard. He's got an army. That's his bodyguard. What about sharpshooter? Who? Would they be referred to as sharpshooter? Well, no. The, the, well, the idea of a sharpshooter, you're talking about riflemen. Uh, Francis Marion had a bunch of really excellent riflemen. For example, he had one group of McCautry, McCautry's riflemen. Who, oh God, these guys were notorious, scared the crap out of the Brits. And, uh, and the actual term sharpshooter was from the Civil War, from the sharps rifle. But they were just marksmen, they were really good at it. But Marion had, uh, as he got bigger, he had guys that were armed with rifles, and he had guys that were armed with muskets. And you used it to your advantage, because uh, depending on, you know, basically how long you could shoot. So it wasn't a bodyguard. You got to realize when a fight went down, the guys that were the sharpshooters, their job was to take out that British officer. In fact, well, I think a famous one is a guy called Lieutenant Toriano, and he got shot through the kneecap because they didn't think he could hit him. And, uh, oh, that made them all change their minds. Like, holy crap, they can hit us. And, uh, but yeah, they, it wasn't a bodyguard though. He didn't. He didn't need a bodyguard. He had an army. I mean, you, who's going to get near him when you got an army? Any other questions? 